Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to continue our series comparing post-ban firearms to their pre-ban counterparts. In my hands, I have my pre-ban HK-93. This is the semi-automatic version of the HK-33, which was developed around 1968 and was based off the already in-use G3 rifle, or what was commercially so, uh, sold as the HK-91. This rifle was manufactured by the Germans primarily for export and a few countries did adopt the firearm. But in the United States, we brought it in as the HK-93, and to be honest with you, I remember when these things were brand new coming in the country, they just weren't that popular. People looked at these, looked at the cost of them compared to an AR-15 of the era, and just went with the AR-15. So HK had a hard time selling them. It seemed like their 308s were their best-selling rifles, the 223s were their second best-selling rifles, and my recollection, of the 80s, they couldn't give away the nine millimeters because they were so expensive, they cost as much as a rifle, that people said, well, why would I wanna buy a nine millimeter rifle when I can buy a 223 or a 308 for the same amount of money? So they couldn't give away the HK-94s. Now the tables have turned and the HK-94 is the most valuable and the most desirable. These are harder to come by and the HK-91s are available, but also the, also the most cloned. And we'll talk about the HK-91 and its clone counterparts in a future video. So this is my HK-33. Uh, I wish it was a 33. I used to have a 33. 93. Sometimes I get the nomenclature back uh, uh, confused, guys, because I'm thinking of the military rifle. The 33 is the machine gun select fire, and the 93 is the civilian model. And this one is called an A3. So we had on the U.S. market an HK-43, which, which was an early predecessor to this. And then we had the HK-93A2, which has a stock that was fixed like this one all right and then we had the hk 93 a3 which this rifle is that has the collapsible two position stock so what we're going to do guys is take a look at this original german made hk 93 and we're going to compare it to one of several samples of u.s made variants that were made after the ban. The original HK-93s are no longer in production and they're no longer importable. You can thank President Bush 41 for banning the import of those. Those were in production, I think, from 1968 until about 2001, and Bush cut us off in 89. That left the door wide open for companies like Vector Arms and even Century Arms to make clones. And so we're going to compare that rifle to this rifle. This is a C93, and this is the Century Arms version of the HK93. And we're going to talk about the differences in quality, fit, finish, and parts used to manufacture the clones. So this, this will give you guys an idea of if you want to go out and spend, gosh, over $3,000 for a pre-ban, or if you want to go out and spend $1,000 or maybe a little bit more, I don't even know, this is Jason's rifle um, for something like the C93 or the Vector. And um, yeah, just a hint, look at the Vector, forget about these. All right, so let's get the video started. We'll do a little bit of shooting with both. We'll show you how to disassemble the guns and how to properly reassemble them without the use of tools. And we'll talk about how the German guns stack up to things like this C93. The HK-93 or HK-33 is based on a Spanish design called the Setme. A lot of people don't believe me when I say that, but after World War II, the German engineers that worked on the roller-locked rifles like the STG-45 uh, went to Spain. They fled. Spain was friendly to the Nazi, Nazi regime, and a lot of their engineers fled there and continued their work, and they helped the Spaniards develop the roller-locking system, which they adopted as their Setme rifle. When the Belgians told the Germans to go pound sand when they wanted to adopt the FAL and license it and manufacture it in Germany, they had to find somebody friendly to them because keep in mind, just a few years earlier, Nazi Germany had occupied Belgium. So uh, they went to Spain, which was friendly to Germany during the Second World War, and they made a deal for the Setme. And that became the HK-91 or G3 rifle that the Germans ultimately adopted. Well, then they used that basis to develop rifles like the HK-33 and 5.56, and of course the HK-94. There were even prototypes, I believe, that were even done in 7.62 by 39. So let's talk a little bit about the features of the HK-93-33. First of all, 
it does use World War II technology with the roller locking system. So basically what you have are two little rollers that, that um, are pushed out into recesses in the barrel extension. And when the bolt's home, those little rollers are stuck out and that keeps the bolt from moving rearward when the gun fires. It's at a mechanical disadvantage. Eventually the recoil forces will overtake that mechanical disadvantage and it will blow back the uh, bolt and carrier, which will then eject the spent casing. Recoil spring pushes it forward, chambers a new round, starts the, the cycle all over again. They have a fluted chamber. By that I mean there are slots cut into the chamber. That's to aid in extraction and ejection. I've seen HKs with completely broken extractors fire and successfully e eject a spent case because of those flutes. Those flutes were added to assist in reliability. Are they necessary? Probably not but the Germans put them in there for a reason because they definitely improved reliability. This rifle has a one and twist tw uh, on the barrel. So that means for every, uh, the bullet will make one complete revolution every 12 inches. Now later in the development of the gun, they would go to the one and seven NATO standard for the M855 Vol, but this is a pre-band gun manufactured in the eighties. Therefore it has the one and 12 twist barrel. All right, so stamped receiver, World War II technology. And I've seen how the Germans built guns like this from the 60s, 70s era, because I've been to the MKEK factory in Turkey, which was all HK tooling. And I saw, and they were building the guns just like the Germans did in the early days in this, you know, the 70s and 80s even. And there was a whole lot of manual processes involved. Manual stampings being done by people putting sheet metal in and hitting the, you know, the button and stamping out the stamp, the, the, you know, the receiver, taking it over, manually folding it, manually welding it, a lot of manual operations in these early built guns. And it's kind of surprising how much actual labor went into producing the guns, which probably is one of the reasons why it's so expensive. Now the roller locking system of the rifle is reliable, but it also requires extreme precision for it to function reliably. All right, that's key into the operation. So you can't just sloppily make a, ro a roller lock rifle. As I say that, I'm sitting next to a sloppily made one that kind of works um, and expect it to, to run with reliability. The Germans could do it, the Spaniards could do it with their set -mies. Okay, so just like most of the HK series of rifles, you have a charging handle that's forward. You have the ability to lock the charging handle to the rear. And so you can lock the bolt open. To charge the weapon, you would just pull this down and let it go or slap it with the palm of your hand. The HK 3393 has a forward assist, which is just nothing more than serrations here where you can push that bolt carrier closed if for some reason it doesn't chamber the round. If you just slap that bolt ch charging handle down 99.9% 9, 99 .9 of the time, it's gonna go ahead and chamber that cartridge. Now this rifle has the carrying handle, which was an option that just clips over the receiver. And they were also set up with mounting points for what they call a claw mount. So you can mount optics back in the day to the gun, magnified optics, even early red dot sights and things like that. Now I don't put claw mounts on my guns because it mars up the finish and I'm a collector. So you'll never see me put a claw mount on an original pre-band. The HKs came in originally with the sheet metal lowers, these big thick polymer grips. And uh, later, of course, they would have what's called the Navy lowers, and they had other names for them that were polymer, which you'll see on the Sentry Arms gun. So that's pretty much it, has diopter sights. The front sight is pinned and is replaceable, but is not intended to be adjusted for either elevation nor windage. In the rear, it takes a special sight tool to adjust for elevation, but windage can be easily adjusted by simply using the screws here go, going left and right. Then on your drum, the, diop the diopter sight, you have a V-notch for 100, and then you have increments all the way out to, and you should be able to see it, 400 meters, okay? So the Germans only intended this, this gun to be used to 400 meters based upon the diopter sight system. And I usually zero mine to 200 because I don't like that V-notch, it's too broad. But up close and personal CQB, I could see that being handy. But for paper shooting, target shooting, I've zeroed mine out at 100 yards using the first hole, which is the 200 meter hole. All right, to load the weapon, okay, I should mention the selector lever is right here, non-ambi. For many people, it's kind of a hard thing to reach. For my big apish hands, I can easily get up there and turn it into the fire position, putting it back to safe to typically have to break my grip. 
I also will say that for me, this big grip and short stock put my arm at such a position that firing from a bench, it's uncomfortable. It gives me carpal tunnel. It gets very uncomfortable to shoot. I find the polymer lowers with the smaller grips to be much more ergonomic. Here's your magazine release, but you will also find some with what's called a flapper release, and you can upgrade this gun to install one, um, and you would then operate it like an AK. The guns originally fed from 20, 25, and 30, and 40 round magazines. These are German-made 30 round magazines that I have here with me today, and we're shooting some Fiocchi 55 grain ball. This is from our friends over at LAX Ammunition. If you would like to purchase some, there is a discount code in the description below, plus an explanation of how we fund ourselves here at the Military Arms Channel. We're 100% viewer supported. We take no kickbacks from LAX Ammunition or Fiocchi or anybody else. But if you would like a discount on some ammunition, there's a link down below, plus some other discount codes, which we receive no kickbacks on. So to load the weapon, I find it easier to do it by first locking the bolt to the rear, taking your magazine, kind of beer canning it. It's a rock and locker, sort of like an AK, locks into place, let your bolt go. The weapon is now ready. On the right side of the weapon, you can see safe and fire being marked clearly. So zero white is safe, red one is fire. All right, so let's go ahead and shoot this bad boy. And it's really a pleasant gun to shoot in 5.56. Not so much in 308, but we'll cover that in the 308 section when we do our 308 video. All right, some people call this the meat tenderizer. And on the 308, I would agree. Uh, on the 5.56, it's just a bit sparse. It doesn't shoulder very well. And the only reason I keep it on here is because that's how I bought the rifle, but I do have a fixed stock for it as well. And I actually prefer the fixed stock for shooting. It's more comfortable. All right, we got a challenge target down at 100 yards. It's an IPSC kill zone target, and there's a discount code down below for challenge targets if you want to buy one of those too. All right, I got to really push my glasses back on my face here. And let's make sure we're on fire, and here we go. All right, typical European design, fired all 30 rounds. You heard it go click, no bang. That's because it does not have a bolt hold open device on the last round fired. To make sure the weapon's safe, pull the charging handle to the rear, put it in its locking recess. I'm gonna go for the flapper, which isn't there. Hit your magazine release, which is well out of the reach even of my ape-like hands. Um, you're gonna reach around and release it like that or something. You're gonna make sure that the weapon's safe. All right, I'm go ahead and put this one on safe. And now let's talk about this rifle. This rifle was manufactured by Century Arms. I don't believe it's in production anymore. It's made with the US receiver, US barrel, and Thai type um, 11, I believe, parts. So Thailand is one of the countries that adopted the HK33, and they used those parts kits along with a hodgepodge of American parts to manufacture this rifle. And it wasn't that long ago this gun was actually being produced. When they first started producing them, I think they came with four aluminum 40 magazines. And then by the time they started getting to the end of their production run, they came with one 40 round magazine because if you get on GunBroker now, these things can bring over $80 each. There was a time when these were dirt cheap and the steel magazines, especially 25 rounders, which are still almost impossible to find, were very, very expensive. Now they're all just expensive. So no matter how you look at it, for quality German military, either aluminum or steel magazine, you're gonna be looking at $80 or more for a magazine. Some polymer magazines exist. I consider them to be junk. All right, so this gun has the one and nine twist in its barrel. 
It has the same diopter sights, same charging handle, but it looks a little bit different than the H&K. It has a parkerized finish versus the painted finish of the H&K. You'll notice it has a US made polymer lower with a much smaller pistol grip, which I actually find to be more ergonomic. This one has the A3 handguard on it. Um, there were early versions of these handguards, which were just round and slender, and those were great for burning your hands. So these A3s are much appreciated. My HK93 has it. It also has this little cutout here, which is for a bipod, which both the HK and the C93 have. The C93 has the carrying handle, which I believe they shipped with, already installed on the rifle. So how well does this gun work? Well, <laughs> kind of depends on what day of the week it is and what ammunition you're using. If we, typically speaking, the German magazines won't lock into the gun. I can't get real German. And if you look, it says made in Germany on the magazine. These are real German magazines for the HK. These magazines will not lock no matter how hard you try. All right. So we can't use real German 30s. We have this 40 round magazine. I'm going to stick this into the gun and it locks in okay. Some of the, the aluminums lock in real easily. Others, you have to really push them in there to get them to latch. To charge the rifle, same thing. Just drop it and it's ready to go. Notice the absence of a forward assist on the bolt carrier. All right, fire controls are the same. You have your selector lever over here. And if you take a look at the rear sight, the weapon's on safe. If you take a look at the rear sight, you're gonna notice something. The rear sight, is all the way over to the right. It cannot, if you take a look at this screw, that's the limiting factor, we've got this edge up against that screw, we cannot go any further right. We cannot get this rifle zeroed. Elevation seems to be good, it's just that windage, let me put it this way, I need to aim at the guy to the right of the target I'm shooting at to hit the target I'm shooting at. So if I wanna shoot the guy on the left, I gotta aim at the guy on the right, literally. So, let's go ahead and shoot the C93. <laughs> I'm going to have to aim way right, and let's see if this works. Okay, yep, I got my Kentucky windage down. I'm just aiming off into space, into the grass, one full body length to the right of the target I'm aiming at. Again, this pistol grip is much more ergonomic for me. Notice how folded my arms are. These are rather short stocks. And this grip is much more ergonomic for me. That's going to vary. But I don't feel like it's giving me carpal tunnel to shoot it like it does with my real HK. I'm going to stop shooting here. Hopefully they're still around in the magazine. People always complain about the AR-15. They say the AR-15 poops where it eats. It's a dirty rifle, and that's a complete joke because, first of all, the carbon of the AR-15 is part of the design. Eugene Stoner was a genius, and carbon is actually a dry lubricant, but I won't get into all that. If you think the AR-15 is a dirty gun to shoot, oh, there's one round left. This started off as a bright, shiny, clean cartridge you'll notice it's covered in carbon. I'm gonna take the round out of the chamber here really quick and show you what that round looks like. This round looks like it's been used in an AR-15 that's suppressed. I mean, even the copper bullet's black. The casing is all black. So if you think the AR-15 is a dirty rifle to shoot, You've never fired a roller lock, and why is that happening, you're probably going to ask. Remember those flutes I was talking about in the chamber? So what happens upon firing is that hot gases, propellant gases, come back down the barrel around that case through those flutes and float that, that case on hot gases. So those gases are able to come back through those flutes into the receiver area of the gun, and that's what makes this thing run so dirty. 
That's one of the reasons why. Not the only reason, but one of the reasons why. So, yes, these guns are extremely dirty. If you put 200 rounds through this thing, it's going to be dirtier than the AR-15 you put 1,000 rounds through. So when you clean these things, prepare to get black hands, black shirts, black everything, because they're extremely filthy rifles. But a quality one, like a real HK or even a Zenith that's made on HK tooling, is reliable despite the fact it is such a dirty rifle to shoot. Got two rounds left. Dang, my Kentucky windage is good. All rounds hit, and the gun's working fine. Now, Jason has had some issues with ammo in the past. Uh, Chase at Definitive Arms has looked at it, and there's a quick little weld to fix things up, which he's gonna do, which will make sure that this rifle runs 100%. The only thing that he should probably do then is get a claw mount, and they have low pro claw mounts now like BNT and companies like that at hkparts.net sell um, alternatives where you can clamp them on, just put an optic on this thing and not worry about the fact that the sight is not zeroable. So the difference between this and the real German made gun is that this one works okay. This one, they're not made anymore, so you're gonna have to get on gun broker. Prices are gonna vary from $600 to $1,000 or maybe even $1,200. Bucks. I mean, it's, it's an auction market because they're no longer made. But when these things were actually on the shelves just a couple of years ago, you could find them for well under $500. Um, even Cabela's sold them for less than $400, I think, uh, going from memory there. So is this gun worth it? If all you want to do is go out and blast and you don't care that the fact that yours may not be zeroable and you'll just go ahead and use an optic, yeah, it gives you the experience of shooting an HK. But keep in mind, this one doesn't work with all HK magazines. You may have to do some custom gunsmithing yourself or send it off to somebody to make it work with German magazines, little things like that. You may want to refinish it um, and you'll, you'll find quirks. I mean, Sentry Arms is really, really bad at producing guns. Their import guns are awesome. They're made overseas by overseas factories, but the stuff they produce domestically like this, generally speaking, are of such low quality, they're not worth owning, and many of them are gunsmithing uh, projects, and this would be an example of that. This one kind of sort of works. We will have to do a small little weld in there and, and, and fix one part on the bolt carrier as far as the rear sight. Yeah, have to bend the receiver or something. <laughs> I don't even know how you would get that zeroed, but uh, yeah. Definitely not the same thing as the German counterpart. Guys, this is an update to the video that we're filming at a later time. We do post to Instagram and we highly encourage you to join us over on Instagram and become a follower. And I say that because we post pictures live while we're filming and a lot of you guys had a great question that totally slipped my mind and that was the Zenith Z43P. Why did this slip my mind? I'm thinking of this as a pistol. I'm not thinking of this as a rifle. And that's something that we were trying to do a comparison of pre-ban rifles versus post-ban rifles. Well, this, in my mind, was a pistol, but it's still a valid gun to have in this video, and it's something we should discuss. Now, these guns come and go from the market. Uh, sometimes you can get them, sometimes you can't. It has a lot to do with the politics going on with Turkey right now, and some of you folks just flat up hate Turkey, won't buy their products, but the reality is, is this gun is as close as you're gonna get to a HK manufactured anything, be it the nine millimeter version, the 5.56 version, or hopefully someday even the 308 version, which they would like to bring into the country as a rifle. So this Z43P, um, they hope to bring it in as a Z43 rifle. They hope to bring in a 308, and the 9 millimeters are currently on the market, but again, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. The price on these things is high. It's expensive. It's going to be probably in the $1,600, $1,700 range. So they're not inexpensive, but if you take a look at the welds and the quality of this pistol, it's gonna be as close as you're gonna to get to the actual German gun. The parts that I have, um, the German parts that I have that I wanna put on the Zenith guns always work. They always fit. 
these guns are made on actual HK tooling. I have an entire video. I toured the MK EK factory. These guns were licensed from Germany. German engineers went to Turkey and showed them how to manufacture them. I've seen the German drawings still hanging on the walls. Um, all the HK marked tooling that produces them. These are produced in the old school fashion like they were back in the 60s and 70s. I mentioned that already in the videos, but the welds are very clean and everything is just straight, perfect and well done. This is a pistol. This one has a side folding SB Tactical brace on it. Now these magazines are currently available on hkparts.net. These are being sold as polymer HK9333 magazines. And these are Zenith mags. These can be clipped together. So, you know, if you want to run three or four magazines uh, clipped together, you can do that. I don't do that, but they lock in just like a regular HK magazine. Notice that this one even has the proper serrations on the um, bolt carrier as a Ford Assist. Some differences. Of course, it's a shorter pistol length barrel. You'll notice the charging handle is much larger, so it doesn't look like a traditional H&K charging handle. But in a practical sense, this is a better charging handle because it's larger and easier to use. All right, you still have the same diopter sights. You'll notice these are just the exact same sights in a traditional HK sense. You can still put a claw mount on it, but you need an HK tool to adjust for elevation, and then you can adjust windage with a standard screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver. Front post everything, straight up HK. All right, let's shoot this little guy with its, uh, its magazine. and perfect function as you would expect. Now remember, we have the magazine release here on the standard pre-band HK. Remember I was talking about a flapper release? This gun has it, and I prefer the flapper release. All right, so this is an actual German magazine, and this is a 30 rounder. Fits into and works just fine in the Zenith pistol. right flapper is awesome and so there you have it you can put hk accessories on it all sorts of good stuff and this would be the highest quality hk clone but i hesitate to call it a clone because it's made on hk tooling i'm um, using hk prints and the people building it were trained by hk engineers but i guess technically it is a clone the best there is on the market outside of the actual h and k now Sadly, the C93 seems to only work, at least this particular gun, and the comments I, that we paid attention to on Instagram, there were people are saying my C93 was a complete hunk of junk, didn't work right at all. Other people were saying mine ran flawlessly, and I loved it. This one is Jason's. It only works with 40 round German aluminum magazines, the Turkish polymer magazines, like the German, metal magazines will not lock into the gun. So in the case of this particular gun, it only works with the aluminum German 40s. So in the end, the best gun that is sometimes on the market, if you're looking for that HK 93 itch, is the Zenith pistol. Taking the HK 93 or one of its clones apart is actually really simple. Some people make it more complex than it needs to be. First of all, I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure that the weapon is clear, and I can do that by pulling the charging handle to the rear and locking it in its locking recess. I can clearly see the chamber, and of course, there's no magazine in the firearm. I'm gonna go ahead and let that bolt go home. Now, you will want the bolt 
completely home, I guess. Just relieve some of the spring tension on the recoil spring. Now the A2, which is the fixed stocked version, versus the A3, which is the collapsible stock version I have here, are slightly different in their disassembly methods. Really the same thing, but just a little bit of difference. So what I do is I slightly collapse my stock. I don't want it fully collapsed and locked, and I don't want it fully extended and locked. I've just found that for me personally, it makes it easier to take the gun apart. Do what you will if you have one. Push your takedown pin apart. I'm gonna apply pressure this way. Push your takedown pin out. Now, because this is an A3, there is no storage facilities in the stock for my loose pin. Don't lose this, you're gonna need it. All right, set that aside, and now, the butt cap comes off and the stock assembly comes off. Set that aside. Inside you're going to find your recoil, uh, recoil spring and guide rod. Set this aside. Now you can take your trigger assembly out. This is different from the machine gun in that you have a pin holding it together here in the rear, but the original machine guns had a pin in the front as well. The new guns coming into the country have a pin in front as well now too, like the Zenith firearms. But back in the day when the ATF took a look at these, they didn't want HK using the pinned lowers because they considered it to be too readily convertible to a machine gun. Apparently their, uh, their position on that has changed. So this lower is slightly different than a current production gun like the Zenith uh, Z43. So I'm just gonna pull this down and away. You can take your trigger pack out if you want to by rotating the selector lever up, pulling this out, and pulling your trigger group out. Not necessary. I mean, this is a pretty self-contained unit. I do not recommend taking this apart if you're not an HK armorer or extremely experienced in the assembly and disassembly of this component, all right? No further than this for field maintenance. I usually don't even go that far. Just wipe it down every once in a while. Now let's get to the bolt. The bolt is in the locked position. To unlock the bolt, very simple, use the charging handle. When you, you have this camming action, when you do this, that breaks the bolt loose from its locked position. So the rollers release. That will also, not, you notice I had my hand over the rear. When you do this, it's very easy to shoot that bolt and carrier right out the rear of the assembly. So now they're free and they'll come out of the receiver. You can clean this and set it aside now as well. Now we have a bolt and carrier. People make this more difficult than it needs to be with regards to disassembly and reassembly. I'm going to show you my method for using um, no tools to accomplish both disassembly and reassembly and this applies to the HK91 as well. We will be doing a video on the HK91 and I will show you the technique that I'm about to use also works on the HK91. What I highly recommend against is using tools to put your bolt and carrier back together. I highly <laughs> advise against not putting the bolt into the rear of your receiver and hitting it with the palm of your hand like I've seen some people do. That's a great way to destroy a very collectible gun. Not destroy it, but mar it up and make it rather ugly looking. You typically want to keep collectibles nice looking, and I wouldn't even do it to a modern clone. Okay, so how do we take it apart without tools? Well, the biggest point of contention with the assembly and disassembly especially the assembly, is this little claw right here, which is under tremendous spring pressure. I've seen ridiculous tools for sale that clamp onto this and compress this spring to make putting the bolt back, back on the carrier easier. An utter waste of money. Okay, so let's take it apart. How I take it apart is I typically lock the bolt. This is what it would look like when it was in a locked position and ready to fire. I just whacked it with the palm of my hand. Now keep in mind, when it's in this position, it takes a lot of force that I can't apply to unlock it. And this is where people put the bolt and carrier in their receiver backwards and hit it with the palm of their hand. Don't do that. All you have to do to unlock this is very simple. What I'm gonna do is just simply rotate the bolt head, see how I rotate it, and keep pressure applied and then I'm just gonna start to wiggle it and it will come right off, all right? Now the locking piece will stay captive for the time being. Sorry, these things are dirty. If you think the AR-15's dirty, own a roller lock. 
Now I'm going to take the locking piece out and the firing pin and spring. To accomplish that, I'm simply going to turn this until it releases. Okay, be careful, it is under spring pressure. Now this is your field stripped bolt carrier, your field stripped bolt with its roller lockers. Now you have your firing pin, your locking piece, and spring for your firing pin. Fully disassembled for field maintenance. Now let's put it back together. Let me show you how to do that very easily without using any goofy tools, without beating your gun up or even bloodying your knuckles. It's not that difficult. So first I'm gonna take my firing pin, put my spring on, drop it into the carrier, and you should see it protrude out the back of the carrier. Now I'm going to take my locking piece, guys, and this is key to all of this. You'll notice right here next to my index finger, there's a little nub, a little notch protruding right here, okay? If you take a look at your bolt carrier, as I'm facing on the right side, you'll see a window. There's one on the other side as well, but we're more concerned with the window here on the right side. When you put your locking piece in, you want this pointed downwards if you're holding your bolt carrier upside down. So now I put it in and I push it back. See how it's compressing under spring pressure? When I do that, I'm going to turn it. And if Jason can see this, look through this window. I'm gonna compress the locking piece I'm going to turn the, ow, stab myself in the finger with a firing pin. I'm gonna turn the locking piece and see through the window, watch as I turn the locking piece. See that little nub up here in the window? I've gone past it, now I'm back. All right, when you see that little nub in that window, you're ready for the next step. Take your bolt, have the bottom of the bolt, this is the bolt facing you, this is your extractor. Have this part facing you. Put it on like this, okay? And now you'll notice that horrendous claw with that massive spring that people sell tools to compress, which are a waste of money. You'll notice that little claw is now lined up with an angle cut to the bottom of the bolt. That's there for a reason. That's so you can push back against it. You have mechanical advantage. And as you push back, don't fully collapse it, but start to rotate that bolt, all right? And as you rotate the bolt, pull it this way slightly, just gently. You'll learn about how much to pull it the more you disassemble the gun. Rotate it until it locks, like it did there, and then pull it to its fully extended position. Notice I didn't bloody my knuckles. Notice I didn't have to beat on it or use a special tool. And the exact same technique We'll work with your HK91. Let's put the trigger group back into its housing. Just drop it in. Line up the holes. Take your selector lever, wiggle it around, and that's back together. Pick up your receiver. Make sure your bolt's in the forward position. If by some chance you screw up and you lock this, just start from the beginning, okay? Rotate the bolt, pull it back out to where this ramp lines up with that little claw. You're gonna have to pull it out. Start all over again, push it back, rotate, pull. There you go, it's just oily, my hand slipped off. And you're back again, okay? Drop your bolt and carrier into your receiver and go ahead and let that go all the way forward. All right, now that it's in the forward position, I invert the rifle, I take my trigger group and you can't come at it at a steep angle because your ejector, which is right here, as your bolt car carrier comes back, it pushes this up, that's your ejector. It will hit the bolt and not allow you to rotate it down. So you're gonna come at it at a very shallow angle just put it down in and push, and now your trigger group is in place and ready for the installation of the stock. With the A3 stock, again, Spring. oh, Jason just saved me. <laughs> we could totally reshoot this, guys, but we're going to leave this type of stupid stuff in because this is what old man brain does.
The gun doesn't work too well without this. Stick it in the rear. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. <laughs> All right, put your recoil spring in, guys. Now, take your stock again, not fully extended, not fully collapsed, and just slide it forward until that little butt cap slides over. I like to set the rifle like this, compress it a little bit because you're working against the recoil spring. Take your retaining pin, put it in, and thanks to Jason's guidance, I now have a rifle that I can shoot. <laughs> Always have a good cameraman. This next segment is for the true fans of the channel. So we have a few questions for you guys to answer. Does it take Glock magazines? No, it takes HK 93 or 33 magazines. Does it 80s hip fire? We're gonna find out, but how well does it bump fire? I think we can figure out the 80s hip fire with the bump fire this time. Make sure that's locked in there nice and tight. Put it on fire and see what we get. So the HK33, I, I want to clear something up that I said at the beginning of the video. Um, it did have fairly widespread use globally. The Germans primarily manufactured it for export, but the West German police and security units did use it, and I believe fairly extensively. But as far as the German military, it was the G3 rifle uh, until they went to the G36. So anyway, uh, the gun does have a military pedigree. The HK93 is a very cool piece of American history in terms of imported firearms. It's a shame that uh, HK no longer makes them because people seem to like what's old again now. We're seeing the resurgence of retro guns like retro AR-15s and companies like PTR, which we'll talk about in our next video when we talk about the 308 version of this, are making you know the retro roller locks and Century did for a short time with the C93 which we saw in this video. So it's really cool to see these old guns coming back because they have a lot of life left in them. Is this the most modern rifle? Is this something I would choose over an AR-15 to go into a fight with? Absolutely not. Would I feel poorly armed with it? Absolutely not. I could certainly make do with this weapon just fine. It's a great piece of Cold War history. So which would I prefer? Obviously I would prefer the pre-ban. The pre-ban as at least as compared to the Sentry gun, which is the only gun we have here. We don't have a vector. This thing's vastly superior in quality to the Sentry Arms gun. Now the Sentry Arms gun, to its credit, has been running fine this afternoon. We have had, have had some problems with it in the past, could have been ammo related, but the gun cannot be zeroed. It feels cheaper. Uh, some of the plastic parts, like the American plastic lower, eh, it's just chintzy. Feels good, but it's just chintzy. If you don't want to spend three to four thousand dollars on an original, consider picking up something like the Sentry Arms, but maybe go after the Vector. I've never owned the Vector, but I hear the Vector is of higher quality, but it's also probably going to bring much more. I haven't checked prices on them, not currently in production, I don't believe, so you're going to have to get on GunBroker and find out what they're going for. All right, guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, keep in mind we are 100% viewer supported. We take no industry money. We're trying to be different than our peers in the, the media industry. We want to be completely independent of industry influence and money. Therefore, we are supported 100% by you, our viewers. And we do that over at Patreon. And you can find us over at patreon.com. There is a link down below. Swing by that link, check out the incentives, and consider becoming a Patreon supporter and helping us to continue our mission here at the Military Arms Channel, which is to bring you unbiased, un-industry influenced information about firearms, even when we're talking about the old stuff. Another great way to support us is a swing by our t-shirt store, forgedfromfreedom.com. Check out the Mac collection, and you can pick up a cool shirt like the full semi-shirt that I'm wearing right now. We have many others to, uh, to select from, and that is another way that we fund ourselves here at the Military Arms Channel. And last but not least, swing by and check us out over at coppercustom.com. That's our online store. Guys, we've been doing this for 10 years. Couldn't have done it without you. And we love each and every one of you. Thanks for watching. And we will talk to you guys soon.
such a smooth shooting rifle. All right, back to the safe. I'll probably break it out again in another 10 years. Bye, guys. <laughs>